All right, I think we should be good to go right now. So again, hi everyone. I'm Natalie Oren, Director of Stakeholder Engagement here at Efficiency Canada. Thank you for joining us for another uh, weekly discovery session. I'm really excited about our, our guests here today, but before I get started, I just want to remind everyone, or if you are new here, the way this works is that our presenter is going to speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll open the floor to Q&As at the end. Um, feel free to use the chat to chat or say, that's an awesome comment or I had no idea um, that's what the chats for but the Q&A box at the you'll find at the bottom of your zoom screen that's where you can ask your questions I can also unmute you and you can ask your question yourself uh, the choice is yours uh, you have two options um, so without further ado I will get started here today so welcome thank you for joining us Jeannie so Jeannie Peters is a PhD or labor market information manager with eco canada and she's been working on a report that uh, eco canada recently released on workforce needs for energy efficient buildings so in the energy efficiency sector um, it's always we want more energy efficient buildings and i'm really interested to see like is the workforce ready do we have it here and if not what can we do to get ready so thanks for joining us today Jeannie. Well, thank you for having me, Natalie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for uh, a brief discussion about the, the research findings that we developed over the past year. Uh, so let's jump right into it. So as uh, Natalie was saying, this is a, a, a talk about energy efficiency for buildings specifically, uh, and what sort of labor is needed and what sort of skills are needed in order to achieve energy efficiency on a wide scale. Uh, for those of you who don't know Eco Canada, uh, we are just out there in the, the universe trying to help build uh, Canada's environmental workforce into the greatest environmental workforce in the world. So if you want more information, let us know. So let's talk a little bit about the scope of the research. This, uh, this research project was um, funded in part by um, NRCAN and by the um, Employment and Social Development Canada's uh, Sectoral Initiatives Program. The idea was to take a look at what requirements were, were, were needed in order to be able to achieve net zero energy ready by 2030. So this is consistent with the Build Smart strategy that was published by Anarchan back in 2017. The focus of the research was asked, we were asked to take a look at commercial buildings, institutional buildings, and large multi-unit residential buildings. The scale of the research was relatively small at this stage. It's a, a qualitative study, uh, but we did get an opportunity to speak to over 25 different stakeholders who are um, representatives of all different phases of the building life cycle. Uh, so we had individuals who were in the construction phase, the unions, we had individuals from ed post-secondary education, we had individuals from architecture architecture and engineering firms, from uh, building um, operations from BOMA uh, and, and other organizations, uh, Vancouver Economic Development. Uh, so a wide range of different uh, individuals were, were participating. Uh, after those 25 interviews, we did some additional secondary research and then we pulled all of that together in uh, two focus group discussions where we re-invited uh, the stakeholders back to, to have a more fulsome discussion and we added a few uh, new individuals into the group as well. So the findings that I'm going to be representing here or showing you here are consistent with the um, opinions that were presented in this particular research. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, what we would consider to be statistically representative. Uh, we know that with only 25 stakeholder interviews and two group discussions, we missed a lot of different opportunities to talk to people, especially um, uh, regional uh, requirements were missed. Uh, uh, we missed out on, on talking about the, the differences between rural and urban um, settings. So uh, it, it, please take it uh, at, as it is uh, in terms of the findings that we've developed here. 
Now, in terms of those key findings, we had five main takeaways, five broad takeaways that uh, were uh, highlighted in this particular report. So the first thing we found was that Canada's building sector workforce, although it's on the way to being prepared to design, construct, retrofit, and operate energy efficient buildings, we would not say that it's fully prepared to do so. In particular, what we found is that there are certain niche companies that specialize in energy efficient construction, design, retrofitting, and operations, and certain departments within large organizations. But these particular um, skills and, and occupations are not as widespread as they would need to be in order to achieve the net zero energy ready by 2030. A second finding was that uh, there appears to need be a need for a cultural shift in order to support the transition to energy efficient buildings. Now, by cultural shift, what we mean is that the technology and the processes that are in important to the development of an energy efficient or net zero energy ready building tend to be more collaborative, they tend to be more um, integrative, they tend to be more uh, across the life cycle type of, of um, uh, skills. So we, we find that that individuals, while, while the, the current uh, I suppose, process for for energy efficient buildings uh, tends to be a more siloed approach where we have the design and then we have the construction in the next phase and then we have the commissioning and inspection and quality control in the next phase and then the operations. The, uh, the idea of the culture shift is that we need to bring together people from all of those different phases of the life cycle, the building life cycle, bring them all together at the beginning of the planning phase so that they're all part of the discussion about what is needed in order to achieve and maintain an energy efficient building. Another thing that we found is that technological changes are driving the need for new skills and occupations across the building life cycle. Uh, in particular, we found that uh, individuals uh, are needing to keep up with technological developments uh, and, and are not necessarily given uh, the, the current uh, environment, especially with the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns and the, the remote learning opportunities, uh, not necessarily being able to develop those skills or, or get the access to the training that they need in order to develop those skills. That said, we also found that both employers and workers lack motivation to change their skills and upskill themselves uh, and change the way they do business until there is an increase in demand for energy efficient buildings. So, so from, uh, from a business owner's standpoint, for example, uh, there has to be some really strong market opportunity to build an energy efficient building and, and, and the return on investment has to be there for, for the business owner. And until business owners decide that there is a market opportunity for energy efficiency on a more widespread scale, the employers of the designers, the construction workers, the quality assurance uh, people are not going to be incentivized to proceed with uh, development of the new skills and technology and processes that are going to be needed for those energy efficient buildings. The last main finding was that we uh, we want to use a grassroots approach in order to address the fact that energy efficiency uh, and the achievement of energy efficient buildings is going to be a very different beast if you're in a rural northern area versus urban Toronto or urban Vancouver. Uh, the availability of uh, workers, the availability of materials and resources um, 
and and the incentives to to build energy efficient uh, are very different in different communities. And so we, we, we want to be able to address those different needs when we develop our approach to helping to increase the, the workforce for energy efficiency. We took a look at a wide range of different types of professionals uh, from design and engineering professionals, energy manager specialists and advisors, IT specialists, construction workers, management supervisors, trade workers. We looked at building managers and operators. And then we looked at the regulatory specialists, QA and QC specialists and commissioning professionals. What we found is that each bucket of workers has a slightly different labor requirement or skills need that needs to be met in order to achieve energy efficiency. One of the key findings for the design and engineering professionals is that they work as gate or they act as gatekeepers for the uh, energy efficiency uh, mandate to be sold to the potential business um, owners. So uh, part of the, the, the training and part of the, the, the new way of thinking that design and engineering professionals will need to bring to the table is this understanding that part of their job is now going to be to explain to potential clients why energy efficiency makes sense from a, a cost and benefit standpoint. Uh, we also found that building managers and operators, for example, um, we have shortages of qualified building managers and operators in the sense that the, the energy efficient building requires very different technological and uh, mechanical skills than a standard building structure does for management and operations. So finding workers who have got the, <clears throat> the, the skill set to, to handle tenant relations, to manage contractors, and to monitor and to understand what the, uh, the, the data is telling them in terms of the actual operation of the building becomes a challenge as well. So we're looking for very well-rounded people. In fact, one of the things that uh, came up often in the discussion was that it doesn't matter where these people are working, whether it's at the beginning phase or the middle phase or the end phase of, of, of building construction and retrofitting, what we need are people who are able to be team players. We need workers who are collaborative, people who understand that their work is integrated with the work of other individuals and can plan around that integration. Individuals who uh, can take leadership roles in teams that they may not have had to uh, with multi with multidisciplinary teams uh, and working with people that they may not have had to work with before. So um, from from that sense, uh, uh, across the board, we found that the, this is a, a requirement for for the workers uh, going forward for energy efficient buildings. We took a look at some of the uh, what we called critical success factors. So, so this is what the world would look like if it were able to uh, support widespread energy efficient buildings. So the first is that we need building owners decisions to align with an energy efficient building stock. Uh, we know that there are some building owners out there who are very engaged in the, um, the energy efficiency space for their uh, properties. They are working at, to achieve different uh, certifications or qualifications or standards uh, related to energy efficiency and low carbon uh, buildings, high performance buildings. Uh, but there is still a large pocket of individual owners out there who just don't see energy efficiency as being an important aspect of their um, design 
or retrofitting decisions. So what we need to have in this particular space is, as I said before, individuals who are able to convey what is important, why, why energy efficiency is important to building owners. We also, however, need a, an investment environment and, and a market environment where building owners are not at a disadvantage in terms of costs and benefits if they decide to go ahead with energy efficiency uh, as part of their, their building plans. Uh, to that end, uh, standardized and, and um, continuously updated codes are helpful uh, to level the playing field for uh, all business owners. If they, if they all have to meet the same energy efficiency standards, then uh, they're not it, it, it still becomes perhaps an additional cost, but they won't be uh, at a cost disadvantage compared to uh, those owners who would not need to meet those requirements. So, you know, a stable uh, regulatory environment is important. Um, providing ways for building owners to de-risk the investment decision into energy efficiency is another aspect that we found to be important. We, we noticed that uh, in this uh, ideal world, uh, the technology, equipment, and materials that uh, energy efficiency buildings need um, are widely adopted. So it's it's not the, the, the case as it is now where we have pockets of adoption uh, in certain areas, certain regions of the country, certain types of buildings. Uh, we want a more widespread adoption of these technologies. And as those technologies become more widespread, the incentive for workers and employers to train to uh, to use that technology, equipment, and materials is going to be greater as well. We want to have business models and practices that are collaborative and promote integration across disciplines. Now, one in per particular aspect of this, per of this discussion is related to the uh, idea that procurement practices right now are designed for a traditional design bid build procurement process whereas energy efficient buildings are more suited to a design build approach where the main contractor has a single point of responsibility to design and build the product uh, so bringing in uh, new procurement practices in the construction of these uh, products is is important Another aspect of it is this building information modeling practice that has been adopted in a lot of other countries, but has not yet been adopted on a wide scale in Canada. Uh, when building information modeling becomes more common, then the building business models and practices become more responsive to that information. One of the challenges of the building sector is that it needs to attract and retain the talent required for energy efficiency. And in some cases, the industry is attractive to particular groups of individuals who are working in the field. And in other cases, there seem to be some challenges. So one of the recommendations that we developed was uh, to, to put out um, an industry and career awareness outreach program to, to uh, maybe make the, the, the building sector or, or working in the building sector a little bit more uh, sexy, uh, much in the same way that the uh, CPAs had an advertising campaign recently, uh, which was meant to, to highlight the exciting world of accountancy. Um, we, we, we want to do the same sort of, of thing with, with uh, the different aspects of the building sector. We, we want to make sure that workers have the skills and knowledge to support energy efficiency. Um, right now, there are a lot of training opportunities out there, although they're not necessarily centralized and they don't relate to specific occupational standards. But 
that said, even though these training opportunities are available, we don't see significant uptake of these training opportunities, in part because the employers and the workers still don't see the, the benefit, the need to go ahead and, and do this additional training, in part because, of course, it's costly. And if, if employers are not willing to pay for it and uh, employees are unable to pay for it, then, then that can't be developed. Um, but there are also opportunities to build this energy efficiency building as a system mindset into traditional training programs uh, for engineers, for designers, for um, tradespeople who can all benefit from having that, that broader mindset. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about this, uh, this need for a strategic approach with grassroots implementation. So by that, I, I mean, basically, we want to come together and collaborate as an industry, strategically identify where the greatest gain will come from in terms of uh, improving the energy efficiency uh, of the building stock, and then to break that down again and develop programs and policies and, and, and incentives that are specific to regions uh, of the country, specific to rural versus urban, specific to uh, small towns versus uh, large cities, uh, so that each area has its uh, needs addressed individually. So I'll just wrap up quickly with a few uh, recommendations that we put forward in this. And, and again, these are very broad recommendations. We, we haven't decided uh, or we haven't uh, identified any individual organizations or individuals that are responsible for, for pursuing these recommendations, but these are suggestions for how we can uh, get closer to the net zero energy ready by 2030. One is to develop a national strategy for the workforce, uh, bring together people from all different aspects of the building sector, from government, industry associations, education, to sit down and think very hard about what is needed to grow the supply of skilled workers, to make sure that the supply is there and that the skilled workers have the skills they need. Part of that is to develop a quantitative outlook of workforce demand. So in order to support this national strategy and to, to help inform it, we want to have information about are there shortages of engineers? Are there shortages of tradespeople? Are there shortages of building operators that are uh, able to operate in an energy efficient space? And if so, what sorts of, of uh, incentives, what sorts of uh, projects can we put forward to, to increase that supply? As I mentioned earlier, industry and career awareness is recommended, uh, particularly for some of our uh, under uh, supplied or, or under uh, represented supply pools. Um, untapped labor supply is, is one area where there's a lot of interest, um, bringing more women into to the process, bringing more immigrants, bringing more visible minorities, bringing more indigenous people. Um, uh, a wide range of different individuals are, are available as potential labor supply, but may not be as attracted to this particular field uh, as yet. And so we want to develop uh, some uh, awareness of that. And then finally, helping businesses develop and retain their, their, their current staff. So, so we know that there are a lot of small and medium sized businesses in the building sector, and they don't always have the same uh, human resource, uh, res well, human resource resources uh, to be able to uh, develop uh, and retain their employees in the same way that larger organizations do. So we want to develop uh, uh, best practices that we can pass along to these uh, smaller companies so that they have the support that they need in order to be able to um, 
promote uh, their their workers uh, to to keep their workers to to make sure the knowledge is is maintained throughout their organization uh, and that their workers are successful. So that uh, wraps up my discussion. Let me uh, see, I, Natalie, I guess we'll open the floor to some questions. I'm, I'm back. I try to keep my video off so I don't distract everyone with my, my nodding head. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you so much. That was, that was really insightful. And I'm, I'm excited to kind of take this information and see where we go from here. Um, so again, just a reminder to everyone, there are two ways to ask questions. One, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. You can ask yourself. Or the second way is there's a Q&A box and uh, you can type your question in and essentially I'm going to narrate it on your behalf uh, and Jeannie will answer it for you. Um, but I told her it's okay that she doesn't have to have all the answers. <laughs> and also a reminder to everyone, um, the same role that we have for our presenters applies to any question you have. Please no sales pitches. Uh, and that includes any uh, statements that are disguised as questions. I will read through them and uh, try and uh, dismiss any of those. So again, uh, Jeannie, let's open the floor to a few questions here. We have one here uh, from Joshua Kelly is, did you uh, identify any recommendations around support for a just transition for workers as the economy generally shifts toward low carbon? Well, that is an excellent question. And uh, we didn't focus on that just transition, or let me put it this way. We didn't have our stakeholders bring up the idea of that just transition directly. Um, as I mentioned, however, there was a significant interest in the pursuit of greater diversity and inclusivity by attracting uh, underrepresented supply pools into the labor force. So to, to the extent that uh, organizations are able to do so, they have an interest in pursuing um, a greater diverse and, and more inclusive workforce. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, with the, the, the smaller and, and medium sized companies, that's not always something that they can put as a priority on their to do list. Uh, and so the, the collaboration of the industry becomes more important in that particular area. Um, the support of post-secondary educational institutions, the support of the government uh, and industry associations coming together to, to uh, provide what businesses may not be able to do themselves. Mm -hmm, exactly, especially small businesses, as you mentioned, they play, they have a lot of hats to wear, including HR and accounting and uh, marketing and communications and all those, plus their job. <laughs> so a good question here is actually from uh, Joshua as well is, as an engineer, I'm curious to hear a bit about more, more about the gatekeeper role you mentioned. Uh, did engineers appear to be a barrier and and what priority action should be taken to remove the barrier or improve adoption? That's an excellent question as well. Uh, I'm not sure that, that engineers necessarily acted as a barrier. What was, I think, more res representative of, of the industry is that engineers are, are likely to do what the client wants. Um, so if the, if the client asks for greater energy efficiency in the structure, then that's going to be what the uh, engineer is going to provide. Uh, what we don't see, on the other hand, is if uh, a business owner comes and says, we just want your average run-of-the-mill standard building, the engineers and the designers don't necessarily step back and say, well, have you considered these other alternatives. These are the benefits of those alternatives. So um, having uh, the, the design professionals and engineers step out of their traditional um, consulting role to, to do a little bit of advocacy on behalf of energy efficiency is, is that part of that gatekeeper um, activity. And, and, and as I said, uh, there are some niche companies where um, you're
you're going to find very strong advocacy uh, amongst the professionals in those companies, uh, certain departments of larger companies. Uh, but on a, on a widespread scale, if it's an engineering firm, it's an engineering firm and it does what the client wants. Yeah, that's definitely the case. And I will say um, we do have a few engineering firms that have joined us uh, officially as allies. Um, so I would say those are the ones that are playing more of an, an active role or appreciate the active role that uh, Efficiency Canada does uh, with the advocacy efforts that we do on behalf of the energy efficiency sector. So I'll just put a plug in. If anyone wants to join as an ally, <laughs> feel free. Um, Another question here is from uh, David. Uh, good question. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer it, so but I'll ask anyway. Uh, who is going to do this for the residential sector, which is going to be a much harder nut to crack? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, at the moment, I can say that Eco Canada does not have that on our, uh, our radar, although. Um, when uh, funders come to us and say we have a particular area of research we're interested in let's move forward uh, but i agree wholeheartedly that um, the residential sector because of its uh, diffuse nature uh, because of the large number of older buildings that need to be retrofitted and the uh, challenges that homeowners face um, in the in the sense that that they don't get necessarily get a financial benefit from from increasing energy efficiency or or not not uh, not as visible a financial benefit as as a commercial or institutional um, organization. Uh, that's definitely a, a a very good question, and I will take that to my uh, next meeting with Enercan and see what they say. <laughs> exactly. We only have so much capacity, I'm sure, and tons of questions and good ones that we'd love to get answered to. Um, a question here actually is actually kind of builds on the last one is from Pamela is what role will Eco Canada continue to play in developing a net zero energy ready workforce? Well, I can tell you that um, We've uh, just got an agreement with the government of Alberta to help develop uh, or to take some of these recommendations and put them into practice within that province. Um, again, it's it's a function of funding. We're a nonprofit organization. So if we get project funding, we can go for it. If we don't uh, have that project funding, it becomes a real uh, challenge. Uh, but we're certainly open to discussions with uh, industry associations with governments, with post-secondary educational institutions. We're excited about the prospect of taking this forward. Uh, it's just a matter of, of resourcing it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, another question here is from David is, will EcoCanada have training courses in this area? Do you have any plans for that or is it? Oh my goodness. Um, I have to say, I don't know what's on the agenda for additional training programs going forward. Um, if uh, you are interested in some of the training programs that we identified that other organizations provide, you can feel free to reach out to, to us at ECO and we can help guide you to, to some of those resources. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm going to have to say, I don't know what's, what's on the agenda for. Okay, I told you you're training. allowed. <laughs> not breaking the rules. I actually just put um, in the chat for everyone, if they're interested, uh, at Efficiency Canada, we actually just, we just did it when the pandemic kind of hit last March. We said, what training courses are available online right now that you know, that we don't host, but that's just out there across Canada. Some of them are colleges and universities that you are more, you know, more robust, <laughs> more time commitment and funding equip uh, commitment. But there's also a few, a number of ones that are free on there. So I just put it in there. There's over a hundred um, actually training options available. So feel free to look at that. It's a, a great list. Again, none of the training is ours, but we just put it there. And if you see something that you have training and it's not on that list, reach out to us and we're happy to add it. Again, it's just a resource that we, we just created there. 
Um, a question from uh, Jean-Marc is, as training slash upskilling is more part of a provincial jurisdiction with federal funding, um, how a workforce national strategy, how could a, a workforce national strategy be created? Well, I think the idea of the workforce strategy is that we want to take into account um, all of the potential opportunities that uh, workers and employers may have to address their skilling upskilling issues across the country. Uh, but you're right, to, to a great extent, some of the recommendations that come out of that national strategy are going to be uh, have to be tailored to specific regions, to specific provinces, um, to specific uh, uh, e even municipalities, depending on what the, the circumstances are for that particular environment. Um, so, so we would take that national strategy and we would build upon that as as resources permit to develop provincial strategies and regional strategies that are allowing us to take advantage of some of those grassroots approaches that we were talking about yeah definitely that's a that's a great approach as well um there's a question here from iram uh and he's uh, gonna challenge you a little bit here okay. is some of the worst energy projects we have seen are design build uh, including quality of equipment minimum insulation costs etc heat recovery chiller are commissioned at the end of the project to operate outside of the range and a year or two later they're out of service so can you explain why you recommended design build based on your research? Well, uh, again, I think the, the, the best way to put it is that this was um, taking information from a small set of stakeholders uh, and representing their particular experiences and understanding of the, the building sector. Uh, I think that some of those recommendations came from uh, observations that have been made of that sort of procurement process in other countries. So uh, we didn't have specific examples within Canada that we can relay in our research. Um, we'd love to hear more from you about those particular projects and get a more fulsome understanding of, of the, the design bid build versus the design build process, um, especially for for um, for our future work where we can hopefully take some of these recommendations and put them into practice. Yeah, thank you. And I know, um, so anyone that wants to get in touch with you, Jeannie, uh, do you, is there a simple, is there an info at Eco Canada? There's a, there's a research at Eco Canada. So research at eco.ca. Okay, perfect. And if you didn't catch that, feel free to respond to me and I'll just flip you uh, your email over to Jeannie or uh, email us at info at efficiencycanada.org. Um, so those are, there are lots of ways to reach out to you or just check out the Eco Canada website. I'm sure you, there's their contact information there as yep. well. We do have a request, actually, if you could go back to the slide on critical success factors. Um, Lucas is taking notes and missed one of the points. Points. Um, so we're just going to wrap up here today. So if you could go back to that and he can, he can uh, take a look at that just while I kind of finish up here. But I will mention that we are recording today's session, uh, as well as all of our discovery sessions are recorded. We do post them on our website. We're pretty good at getting them up probably the next week, usually around Tuesday of the following week. So feel free to look at there. There's uh, actually, you know what? Today is the one year anniversary. I should, I should have started off with that. It's a one year anniversary of doing the discovery sessions. So you can look back and, you know, if you didn't have weekend plans, well, now you do. <laughs> So a reminder um, that we will actually not be having a discovery session next week because of the long weekend. Uh, so it is Good Friday, so it is a stat holiday in a lot of uh, provinces. 
Um, so we won't be here. However, I will say we'll be here the following week. And if you are actually interested in presenting yourself, uh, our presenters each week are other not-for-profit organizations uh, or along with our allies that uh, support us. So if you're curious about joining Efficiency Canada as an ally, you can find the information on our website or feel free to reach out to uh, myself directly and I can send you the details and we can have a chat. So again, thank you so much Jeannie, wonderful. Uh, thank you for doing the research. And now that it's here, I'm excited for everyone's excited for next steps on this research and uh, taking it and putting it into action. So um, again, and once you do that, res once you find the funding for that residential question, uh, we'd love to have you back <laughs> when you share the results. So have a great weekend, everyone, and I'll see you uh, in two Fridays. Take care. Mm -hmm.